So hybrid functionals, let's go there. So well, this we did uh, to some degree uh, yesterday. And I've told you that, that one, of the, one of the key things that we do is, uh, is map our all electron problem onto, uh, onto a one electron description. And yesterday we talked about DFT. Well, another one electron theory would be um, Hartree Fock theory. Um, so we can, uh, we can write our many body um, wave function as a Slater determinant that involves um, these one electron functions that we saw yesterday, right? So this has, uh, this has a few uh, interesting uh, properties. And one of the properties is that it includes the, uh, the Pauli exclusion principle in a, in a natural manner, right? So no two uh, electrons of the same spin can occupy the same orbital. Um, and that is uh, expressed, for instance, here, right? So if these uh, if, you have, if you put two electrons in uh, with the same spin in the same orbital, uh, this will be essentially zero. Okay, Hartree Fock theory is a uh, well, well known uh, approximation in, uh, from, from, sorry, oh, from quantum chemistry. Um, and uh, with this particular ansatz for the many body wave function, uh, we end up. Uh, uh, when we want to solve for these, uh, for these one electron functions, like we did yesterday um, by means of the cone sham equations, we have very similar uh, looking equations now that we have to solve. And those are these uh, Rothan equations uh, written down here. And actually, the only, the only, the only obvious uh, difference now is that uh, where we used to have uh, an expression with, that contained uh, in the Hamiltonian only local potentials, now we have a non-local potential as well. So the, the Fock exchange potential depends on R and R prime. And uh, not only is it non-local, um, it is um, orbital dependent. So, so we, we're not, we, had, we, have, we end up with an expression uh, that does not depend only on the density, but depends on the orbitals itself, right? So this is the, the exchange potential and you see here there's a sum over the uh, occupied orbitals um, yeah so that uh, that has some uh, some consequences uh, that has some consequences for the way we solve for these equations um, and obviously a sum over over states here um, inside of this potential has some computational consequences as well so it's quite a bit more expensive to evaluate the action of such a potential on another orbital than the action of the uh, exchange correlation potential in density functional theory on an orbital, which is a simple point by point multiplication. <laughs> huh? Here we have something. So what, what you see here, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll discuss how, how, this is, uh, how this is done in a plane wave code, but this is very similar to, um, to what we do for the Hartree energy. So sol solving. Uh, and computing the action of this potential on the orbitals involves uh, FFTs. And, and th the way in which it involves FFTs, I'll discuss later. So, um, well, that is Hartree Fock theory. So, what, what I will speak mostly about is about Hartree Fock DFT hybrid theory. So, is there, uh, because we could use Hartree Fock, but that is for, for our purposes of limited use, because in Hartree Fock, um, for instance, and let's have a quick look at what, what the density of states in Hartree Fock for the homogeneous electron gas would be. And let's assume that this is indicative of what, for instance, would happen if we would apply this uh, theory to a metallic system. Then we see that um, in uh, Hartree Fock <coughs> theory, at the Fermi level in the um, homogeneous electron gas, there's a cusp. So there's no, the density of states at the Fermi level in Hartree Fock theory uh, for the homogeneous electron gas goes to zero. Um, essentially means there, there are no metals in, in Hartree Fock, right? So, um, um, and that's one of the things that, that's already a good indication that, uh, that this is not going to be the, the approximation that we want to use. So what we are going to use actually is a mixture of Hartree Fock and DFT. We're going to be adding uh, some um, some DFT correlation 
to uh, our heart refoc expressions. So that is uh, so another sort of hand waving argument why it is nice to uh, to uh, use mixtures of heart refoc and DFT as a, a functional, why it would be a good idea to use these hybrid functionals um, is, is sort of made here. So we see here for a number of materials we see um, the band gap, the theoretical, the, so the computational band gap versus the experimental one. So this line would indicate perfect agreement. We see that in DFT we typically underestimate the band gaps. So this is essentially always the case. <coughs> uh, and in Hart and Fock, we strongly overestimate them. So uh, a simple-minded approximation would be, so why not mix the two together and end up on this line, right? So, um, and that is one of the things that, uh, that we hope to achieve by using these hybrid functionals. Other, other um, arguments to go beyond DFT um, are typically, well, band gaps is one that this point is made here. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, that our, in DFT, our description of total energies and total energy differences, so the energetics of, um, of chemical reactions, for instance, is by no means uh, very accurately described. So um, DFT is very good at predicting structures and the like, but the total energy differences of reaction barriers, reaction enthalpies, and things like this are, are definitely not uh, at the level of comparison to experiment that we would like. Um, yes, and one of the other things that's missing in DFT, but that will unfortunately still not be addressed by hybrid functional theory, is the fact that in DFT van der Waals interactions are missing. So those are a few arguments uh, why there's a definite need to go beyond DFT. And well, hi hybrid functionals are, are a first step beyond uh, DFT in that sense. So. Uh, Per definition, these exchange correlation functionals admix a certain amount of Fock exchange to a part of a local or semi-local density functional. So uh, we're going to be using uh, well, the Fock exchange in combination with uh, well, a description of electronic correlation based on the density functional. And uh, the typical ones that, that are, well, those are de they have become very popular in, in solid state physics are called PBE0 and uh, HSE. And PBE0, so the recipe is very simple. So it's essentially a quarter of Fock exchange uh, married to uh, three quarters of a PBE, so which is a very, very common density functional PBE uh, exchange, and added to it the correlation of PBE. Uh, so it's non-empirical in the sense that, that this admixture of a quarter of um, <coughs> Uh, of, of Fock exchange is based on, uh, on a theoretical work. So it's not simply fit to, to, uh, to experiment or something like this. Um, another very popular uh, functional is very much alike. PBE0 is called HSE or HSE03 or HSE06. There's a few varieties of it. And these, those are essentially a quarter of uh, the short range component of Fock exchange, three quarters of the short range component of PBE exchange, the complete long range component of PBE exchange and PBE correlation. Um, so in what sense short range and long range? Well, in, in this work for these functionals, the one over R, uh, which is the essential operator in the exchange, one over R, has been decomposed in a short range part and a long range part by means of an, of an error function. Uh, and, and the range at which this separation is done uh, is controlled by a parameter, and that parameter is a semi empirical one. So that has been, uh, there's a, it's an optimal choice uh, and has been fitted to, uh, to atomization energies for, for a, a, a test set of molecules. Right? So, um, the thought behind this, this the, well, the first thought behind it was that um, uh, this was implemented in a, a Gaussian basis code, and if I do ex if I do a Fock exchange, uh, which is com computationally intensive, but I am able to to limit the range of, of my interaction, there's less integrals that I would have to uh, have to compute. So this was conceived as being a cheaper variety of PBE zero, 
actually. But it has some qualities of its own, actually. So these days it is, it is cheaper to use this than to use PBE0. And I show, I'll show you why, also in plain wave codes. Um, but in fact, this has some, some nice uh, properties in its description of physics as well that are different from PBE0. So it's a bit more than just a cheaper variety of PBE0. But it's semi-empirical in that sense. So the one that, that, uh, that, that comes from quantum chemistry, hybrid functional, that you can use in WASP as well, is B3lib. Um, it's a semi-empirical functional. It combines a whole bunch of terms. So here we see Fock exchange. We see some LDA exchange in it, some other functional, uh, some exchange <coughs> from another density functional, and a combination of two uh, correlation functionals define uh, the correlation of, of B3lib. Um, I won't go into all these different correlations, um, <coughs> just uh, all these different contributions, just to say that this functional is of very limited use in solid state physics uh, because the LYP correlation uh, violates a certain, uh, certain limit. So there, there's a way that, that correlation functionals should, should behave uh, for the homogeneous electron gas. There we can sort of know exactly what they should do and LYP doesn't do it. And that hurts quite a bit in, uh, so in solid state. So this is a very popular functional uh, from quantum chemistry. It works well for, for, for whole bunches of molecules, but in solid states it, it's not so good. Okay, so coming to the computational aspect. So this is the thing that we, that we would like to uh, to evaluate, right? So I saw this uh, written it down before. This, you saw the potential, which was orbital dependent. So we have two sums of, over, over the orbitals uh, to, to compute our Fock exchange er energy. And we have a one over R minus R prime kernel, or this, um, this energy, uh, this, this um, range separated kernel, this short ranged one, right? So how do, how do we typically go about evaluating such a thing? So the first thing that you would do is hey, you have two orbitals um, um, at different uh, k points, right, and two different bands. So this sum is over two times over all k points and two times over all uh, occupied bands. So this is quite, quite, more, this is quite a bit more expensive than DFT would be. Um, so for each of these what we call overlap densities, for each of these combinations, we do an FFT and get this, what is called this overlap density into a reciprocal space. And then you can easily evaluate the potential that this overlap density casts, right? Because in reciprocal space, uh, one over R minus R prime uh, times this density is simply given by the, by the, um, by the um, Fourier component of the density at a certain G factor divided by this, the length of this vector uh, to the power of two. So you get this, the potential that is the exchange potential that is caused by this overlap density. And that is then FFT again. So there's two FFTs already involved uh, back to real space. And there you can then um, evaluate the action of that particular potential on an orbital. So essentially for all combinations of, of K and Q, which run over, the, over our set of k points and NM, NMM, which are our bands. For all these combinations, we have to do, uh, to do two FFTs. So which is quite a bit more expensive. You, beco before we used FFT to, uh, to compute the Harvey potential, but there was only one density there, right? It's the total density. To do one FFT, you have the potential. And here we get a potential arising from each combination of these orbitals. So that is uh, quite a bit more expensive. Um, so how does it scale? Well, essentially it scales, um, essentially it scales as uh, n to the power. Uh, well, let me see. No, here, here we have it. So we have the number of bands which scales uh, as the as the <coughs> size of our system, uh, and the number of k points. So number of bands, and this is. This is essentially, this scales as, as the system size, right? So the, the size of our FFT grid scales as the system size. And in the limit of a large system where we have no uh, K points, we end up here, number of bands, system size, system size, and this essentially system size as well. So this scales cubically uh, 
uh, with respect to the system size. Um, as essentially our implementations of density functional theory do as well, right? Because we do um, uh, orthogonalization of the wave functions uh, with respect to each other. And this involves a matrix diagonalization. And matrix diagonalization, the way we do it, uh, scales uh, cubically. Um, you don't see this behavior normally for DFT because other contributions that scale better have much larger prefactors. Um, here you would see the, the, the cubic scaling behavior of this evaluation immediately. This has the largest prefactor. But the essential scaling is the same as, as our DFT implementation, which is cubic in system size. So um, let me see, where is this? Uh, these slides have been... Okay, so... Um, Excuse me. <coughs> yeah. If you do hard to reform with Gaussian, because you don't have the FFT or gain track, then it's n to the 4, is that correct? Um, if you would do it uh, with Gaussians, actually the scaling is better because you work with a localized oh. basis. But, but if yes. Not if ignoring it the local part. If you ignore the local part, it would go to n to the power of 4, right. But in all practical uh, implementations of it in local basis sets, you can get the scaling down below uh, cubic scaling uh, because you can uh, exploit the fact that your basis functions <coughs> will overlap only with ones that are close by, right? Yeah, right. Uh, so I would want, like to introduce this concept. Well, this is, this is a few slides that, that will sort of show you why it is cheaper to use this HSE uh, functional than PBE0. Um, and, well, this, this functional was, was, was first implemented for, for a code that uses Gaussian basis. And they said, well, we limit the range of our interaction. That is why we will have less uh, integrals to evaluate because uh, this orbital doesn't interact anymore with an orbital that's, that's farther away if, if I limit my interaction. A similar thing, uh, a similar um, saving in cost, in computational cost, uh, we have for HSE um, as well uh, if we use plane waves and I will, I will show you why. So there's two things to uh, remember here. So we have, we have two uh, sums over uh, over k points, one is over q and one is over k. Well, let's assume that this, this sum over q is essentially um, is what we call uh, is the, the, the sampling of, of reciprocal space for our Fock potential, right? So let's, let's assign that one the vector q. And then we can ask ourselves, can we, uh, can we limit the, the sampling for one of these sums, nam namely the one uh, we use to represent the Fock exchange, this one of these sums over, um, over k points, can we limit that to a coarser set? And that is shown here what, what the effect would be. So I do here a calculation for, I think this is aluminum, yes, FCC aluminum. Uh, and it's done at uh, well, for, in, for instance, here at a very dense uh, grid at 24 times 24 times 24 uh, k points. And then I start to, to coarse grain one of these sums and I see an effect in the energy, right? So deviation from, from the result uh, by limiting the representation uh, of Fock exchange, only of Fock exchange. So Hartree energy is still sampled at, at, the, at, the high, at this high density. So we see here, okay, immediate deviation. So this, this hurts our result. If we go to HSE, we see that we can downsample the grid with which the, the reciprocal space grid that we use to uh, represent the Fock exchange quite a bit, right? So we go from 24 times 24 times 24 k points all the way down to 6 or to 4 by 4 by 4 k points. And there's hardly any effect uh, visible in the exchange energy. And that is actually. Uh, because of this reduced range of, uh, of the exchange interaction. And there is a, there is a connection between uh, the number of k-points, so the k-point density sampling, um, there's a connection between that and, um, and the range of the interactions that you are, uh, are representing. 
So that, that is a, it's a, general, uh, a general connection. And to, to sort of explain this point uh, to you, uh, it's, it's going to be a hand-waving explanation, I first need to, to uh, introduce the following situation. I, I'm not sure if everybody is aware of this, but I, I think so. Um, anyway, so if we, use a, um, if we use a small cell, let's say this is our unit cell, and we use two K points, right? So the first K point, for instance, is the gamma point, and we see that a, a wave function in this particular cell is simply repeated from one, one cell to the next. Yeah? So if you then go to this situation, which is at another K point, so this would be, for instance, an X point, we see that the sign of the wave function from one periodic repeated image to the next changes, right? So we have one band and two K points, and these are the functions that we have. If I now double the size of my cell, I can uh, limit, uh, I can half the density, the sampling density uh, of, uh, of K space and end up with mathematically exactly the same situation, right? Because now I have uh, in, my, in my doubled cell, I will have a wave function uh, that has two peaks of the same sign, and I will have another option that is still cell periodic, where we have the sign change inside of, of my supercell, right? So now I have two different bands in my, in, my, uh, in my larger unit cell, and I have only one K point, and this is mathematically exactly the same situation. So that is sort of... Uh, put in a, in a general fashion here, so hey, unit cells versus k points is inversely proportional. If I, if I have n k points along a certain direction in my unit cell and I multiply this unit cell with n, I can limit my k point sampling by a factor of n. I can divide it by a factor of n. Okay. So how does this, uh, how does this connect to what we said about ranges of interactions? So let's assume that we, have a, that we have a maximum interaction range, which is a, a, a certain integer number times uh, a cell size, right? Times a, a unit cell. Then if I take a, 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 a supercell of the, this unit cell, uh, that is twice this interaction range, then my complete interaction will be contained within this particular cell. Yeah? And that means that actually that I can use this particular cell with only one K point to capture all aspects of this particular interaction, right? So equivalently, that would mean that I could, uh, that I could go back to a single unit cell and sample my first Brio and so on at two M points and capture all aspects of this particular interaction. So there's a direct connection between interaction range and sampling density in the first Brio and so on. Right? And that is what the thing that helps us when we go to this, to this, uh, to this Fock exchange and limit its, its range of interaction. That means that as we limit it, we need only that, that we need a less dense grid of, uh, of points in reciprocal space to represent its potential uh, in, a, in a satisfactory manner. So we can coarse grain our representation of this interaction because of the fact that it's that its interaction range has been limited. So how does this work out? What does this look like in terms of, uh, of horrible looking equations? Uh, well, we see here, this is this, is this H and Z interaction, right? So this is this range separated uh, kernel, the short range part. And there are our orbitals. Well, we can take this whole thing to, um, <coughs> we can take this, uh, the potential corresponding to this, we can take this to reciprocal space, and we see that here uh, in that particular expression, just forget about all, all, all the rest, uh, that we have a sum over, um, um, over block vectors in this, uh, in this uh, potential. And so we have a potential at the point K, and that contains a sum over block vectors Q. And this particular sum we can now uh, coarse grain. So, so we'll still compute our potential for all our orbitals at all k points where we have orbitals. But to do this, we'll, we'll <coughs> coarse grain this particular sum. And that is done in, in HSE. Or you can do this in HSE. It's not done uh, per default. But it's something that you can use to, uh, to reduce the computational cost. Um, so this is uh, 
this is one of the things that I spoke about yesterday. So what we see here, the, the green, uh, we saw the blue and the green line yesterday. It's a comparison of, um, of the atomization energies for a test set of molecules. And in this case, for, again, for PBE and PBE0 compared to a, a Gaussian, uh, to Gaussian calculation. So the, the comparison between the two codes is, is, is almost perfect. So there's, there's um, hardly any differences uh, much larger than one kK per mole. Um, but we see that with respect to experiment, there are still uh, quite big differences. Uh, they're smaller uh, for, for the hybrid functional than for PBE. So the hybrid functional is the red line, and PBE is the black line. But we see that our, uh, that our accuracy is, is still far away from chemical, chemical accuracy. Um, yes. So let me see how we're doing. OK. So there's a whole bunch of slides that I, that I think I will, uh, I will no, this one I will skip. Um, so atomization energies we have seen. This is, I will skip, yes. So this is one, um, because the other ones, they, they, they're just sort of there to show you that structures we get from hybrid functional theory are pretty good, um, as good as, as the ones from DFT. Um, atomization energies, somewhat better in some cases, somewhat worse in other cases. It's not a real big step forward. Um, so the real positive news about, uh, about hybrid functional theory is actually in a description of, of band gaps. And that is what we uh, see here. And we remember the first picture that we saw, we had uh, all these blue points um, are, are DFT points. So with the PBE functional, has strong underestimation of the experimental gap. Um, and we had Hartree Fox sort of out here, right, strongly overestimating it. Uh, and now we see here uh, the hybrid functional theory, so PBE0 and HSE03. Um, and they're pretty close to, uh, to experiments, so it's, it's a nice step, n nice step forward, especially if you're, if you're working with, uh, with uh, small to, to medium-sized uh, gaps. Uh, so if you're in semiconductor physics, then hybrid functionals will, will present a, a real nice step uh, forward uh, for you. Um, and there we see as well the, um, what we see here is the, uh, the, the advantage of using this of <coughs> using this HSE functional over PBE0. I said that one is cheaper than the other, but that's not the only thing. It has some uh, nice characteristics uh, of its own. Uh, you, we get slightly better band caps from, uh, from this range separated uh, hybrid functional than from PBE0. And, um, in the talk about GW, there's a, there's a small picture that sort of explains why, why this, there's some physics behind it, why we do actually get a better description, especially for small uh, gap <coughs> systems with HSE than with PBE0. So this is a very nice... Uh, do those yeah. LED systems have realistic corrections on them? Um, those LED systems are, um, well, we do include spin orbit uh, coupling. Okay. Yeah. But so the way we include spin orbit coupling in the PRW, there's part of the spin orbit splitting is missing because we, our, our local basis functions don't capture all of the spin orbit effects. Right? Yes. Is there some specific reason why the band gap is underestimated by PBE and does it like right estimate by HSE? Um, well, uh, well, P DFT always underestimates the band caps, and there's a, there's a, um, a world of literature uh, explaining why this is so. It's not something that I, that I could regurgitate here, unfortunately. Um, for the other matter is, I mean, we saw that, that Hartree Fock strongly overestimates band caps. There's explanations for that as well. And what we see here is the the effect of the of the admixture, and yes, there is reasons why band gaps uh, come, especially in this particular uh, part of the of the gap size, come out very well with HSC, and that will be um, can sort that can be explained. I will I will show you this later on when we start looking at, at dielectric screening in somewhat more uh, detail, uh, because the the thing is. That what we what we would like to use we could um, we would like to use here we admix one quarter of of uh, Fock exchange 
over the whole range, right? And we simply admix one quarter, and this, this mixture factor should ac actually be different as we move to, to larger uh, gap-sized systems. So, uh, because here you see that the hybrid functional still uh, strongly underestimate the band caps for large gap systems. One could repair this by simply adding more Fock exchange. You would, would move closer to this, to this gap. Um, and that is uh, something that you can, that you can argue from, from the dielectric properties. So if you would, if you would use a correctly screened um, um, uh, exchange interaction, screened by the, by the true dielectric properties of the system, then you would have this, well, you would have a variab variable uh, admixture of Fock exchange over the whole range, and then you would be sort of as close to experiment everywhere. So and that is and that is that is exactly the thing. So this this variable admixture uh, uh, determined by the by the true dielectric properties or a description of the dielectric, prop dielectric properties of the system that is the essence of what what GW does. So but we'll come back to this later. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. Sure. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> so a very good, a very good. Uh, uh, po well, le let's look here at, at gallium arsenide, right? So, for instance, so quite a bit away. Let, and here, zinc, uh, zinc. Uh, what is it? Zinc selenide, zinc oxide should be still pretty. Zinc oxide, right? Yeah, zinc oxide. Uh, so no, no, unfortunately not. But it, it's prone to do uh, <coughs> it's prone to do quite well for small and medium sized gap systems. Yes. And how sensitive are these calculations with regard to pseudo percentage potentials? Um, yes, I uh, they shouldn't be sensitive. Uh, shouldn't be more sensitive to this than uh, than DFT is. Yes. Yeah. Right. So that is something that, that um, uh, so we don't have uh, particular pseudo potentials generated to be used with hybrid functionals. Um, we do have, uh, as, as we spoke about yesterday, we do have sets of pseudo potentials that are, th that are thought to be used uh, with in connection with GW. Uh, but for hybrid functionals, you see mostly you would simply use the PBE um, potentials with these functionals. I mean, to a very, very large degree, uh, these functionals are still PBE, <coughs> right? So there, there's like three quarters of them or more is still PBE. Yep. Uh, so <coughs> if we don't know a system is metallic or gas a priori, and you use HSC blindly yep. to uh, do all of the expected band gap opening up? Uh, no, nope. this uh, uh, Hartree Fock will always give you a gap or a cusp at, at the Fermi energy, but these uh, in, in hybrid functional theory, there's metallic systems. So m most metallic systems will, uh, most systems that should be metallic will uh, come out to be metals. Um, unfortunately, and, that, and I'll, I'll go to that, that particular uh, case uh, uh, later, um, DF, the DFT description of metallic systems is better than the hybrid functional description of metallic systems. So these are not, hybrid functionals are, are, are nice for a whole bunch of, of systems, but they're not universal. So, and that is one of the, one of the points that, uh, so yes, that I would like to make uh, here on these slides. So this is a long, <coughs> this was a long-standing <coughs> long problem, I should say. Uh, and this is an archetypical, <coughs> archetypical system that people have been looking at uh, quite intensively. Uh, so CO adsorption on, on D-metallic surfaces. Uh, and in DFT, uh, we had uh, incorrect predictions that said, well, the CO prefers the hollow side and, and the, um, the uh, Adsorption energies were off by quite a bit, so there were large errors in the adsorption energies. Um, and I think this, 
what do we see here? So this is C, this is on the top side and this is on an FCC hollow side. So DFT prefers this, whereas experiment tells us that it should be there, right? Um, so there was lots of hope when we started out with these hybrid functionals. There was a big hope that, uh, that they would get that right because uh, people said, okay, why, do, why does this come out wrong in DFT? Huh? Why, do we, why do we have an incorrect description of this site preference, for instance? Um, and uh, people blame the fact that DFT doesn't give you a, a good description of the molecule. Right? So we have, uh, we have in the CO molecule, we have a homo-lumo gap that is much too small in DFT. So our, our lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is too close to, uh, to, the, to the metallic D states. In, in if you look at, at the band structure of, this, of, this, uh, of such a setup, it's too close. So it hybridizes, and the D metallic D states hybridize too strongly with the uh, unoccupied state of the molecule, which is called backbonding. And that leads to a situation where actually, uh, so in the hollow side, this backbonding is stronger, and that is why DFT prefers to put this molecule uh, in such a hollow side where it should be on top. Uh, it's, so blame it, blame it on the DFT description of the CO molecule. Um, and hybrid functionals do quite well for the electronic structure of, of these small molecules, right? So they're, they're sort of fit to this, and, and, and we have seen this, that the atomization energies of such small molecules come out much better. So there was high hopes that this, this such a particular setup where, where in essence we have, we have two extremes, right? So we have completely delocalized metallic states, and we combine this with sort of strongly localized molecular type states. And the hope was that hybrid functionals would do uh, well because of the fact that they do much better, they give a much better description of the molecular states. Well, this hope was, uh, was uh, uh, unfortunately idle. So we do see that for some, uh, for some, um, <coughs> some of these surfaces, so CO and copper, uh, these hybrid functionals, PBE0 and HSC03, do quite well. Huh? So we get the right side preference. Uh, we get uh, a reduction in the adsorption energy, get much closer to experiment. However, when we then go to uh, so, and sort of the same for rhodium, uh, although uh, here the size of the adsorption energy uh, it, yeah, it moves in the wrong direction. It's even stronger overestimation, but at least the side preference is correct. If you then go to palladium, we see that not even the side preference comes out right. Um, so unfortunately, and that is, that is sort of telling you already, um, uh, so th this, this archetypical system gives you sort of an already a, a, a good picture of the fact that these functionals are not to be used universally. So they're good for some stuff and not so good for others. And essentially what we see is, well, we, we, do, get a better, um, we do get a better description of the LUMO, so there's a less <coughs> There's less backbonding. Um, there's less backbonding with the LUMO because of this, but the description of the metallic states is wrong. So they, they end up much too high in the spectrum, and again there's a too strong interaction between the, the metallic D states and the molecular states, and you get the site preference wrong in some cases. Right? So we have two things. We have an overestimation of the metallic. <laughs> the metallic D bandwidth in, in these hybrid functionals and the downshift of the D band center in copper sort of counters it. So there we see it, there we have a nice description, but in the other cases, this overestimation of D metallic bandwidth uh, will sort of restore this overestimation of the backbonding again and the description is not good. Um, so yes, um, that was sort of a, a blow um, but that is, that is what, what we are at. So this is nice if you're in, for instance, in semiconductor physics, this is very nice if you, uh, uh, things like um, if you study defects um, where you would like electrons to localize at. DFT is bad at lo localizing electrons at, at, at defects. DFT prefers delocalized state in, 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 let's say, in a general way of speaking. If you would use hybrid functionals there, you would tend to do much better uh, because this hartree fock part of the description uh, likes to localize electrons. Yes, so. 
I think the, all, all these points I've made before we can we can skip. So just to uh, this just lists a few of the texts that you said in in connection with hybrid functionals. Um, these ones here they control this particular downsampling that you might use um, for. Um, uh, to coarse grain the representation of the uh, Fock exchange in HSE. Uh, this bunch of texts that you see here are all these different admixtion factors and uh, this is essentially the combination of, of those that you would use to either select PB0, HSE06 or 03, uh, B3lib or complete Hartree Fock, right? Complete Hartree Fock, there you see it's a Fock exchange to the full no LDA correlation, no GGA correlation. That would be hard to fuck. And these are all kinds of other recipes, sort of, that you could use. Okay, um, let's, a, a few words about doing band structure uh, for, um, <coughs> for hybrid functionals. Um, this, well, this is a sort of a computational point. Um, uh, because the way we do band structure normally is we would, for, for a DFT, we would generate a self-consistent charge density. So we take some, some k-point grid, uh, a sufficiently dense one, but a regular one, and uh, do, a, do a ground state calculation. Then we take the charge density, the self-consistent charge density that results from this calculation, uh, read it in at the second calculation, keep it fixed throughout, and in the second calculation we compute the eigenvalue spectrum add a whole bunch of k-points along these high symmetry lines, right? Why do we do it like this? We do it like this because you couldn't, you couldn't really um, compute, you couldn't do a, do a reliable ground state calculation using the k-point sampling corresponding to these high symmetry lines, right? Because you would have a few k-points along a line and then it would move uh, along another direction, but you don't have an, uh, a truly nice homogeneous sampling of your Bream and so on then. So the charge density associated with, with that particular sampling along high symmetry lines is bogus. So you shouldn't use it. Right, so we use the charge density from a, from a previous calculation to do this. Well that is now, unfortunately, for these hybrid functionals, no longer possible. Because our, our, uh, our potential uh, so part of our Hamiltonian doesn't only depend on the density. So you could read in the density, but we have a potential that, that depends on the orbitals as well. Right? So, so there's a way around this. So this is the standard procedure right? So what that I spoke about. First compute the density, then in a second run you fix the density with this I charge is 11 and you use uh, a bunch of k-points, in this case along a line from, uh, from g to x, for instance, and you could plot it. Um, and what we do to compute band structure for hybrid functionals is the following. We do a standard, uh, a standard DFT calculation uh, using a conventional uniform k-point mesh, and then there's a file that's called e z kpt, uh, that contains the symmetry-reduced symmetry uh, uh, k-points that were used in this standard calculation, which was a DFT calculation. So those are these points, and those are the weights associated with them, right? Because this, this is the irreducible part of the Brillouin zone, and those are the, the symmetry-reduced points, and those are the, the weights associated with the symmetry reduction. Um, and then what we do is we add a whole bunch of points to this file, and those correspond to points along the high symmetry lines where we are interested in eigenvalues. Uh, eigenvalue, the dispersion of the bands along this line. And we add them, but we add them with zero weight. So we will get uh, solutions at these k-points, so we will get band energies at these k-points, but they will not contribute to the density and they won't contribute to the Fock potential. So that's sort of a trick. So these bands that, uh, sorry, these k points that correspond to a regular grid, they will uh, build up the potential. Uh, they will they will define our Hamiltonian, in the sense that they will contribute to the density and contribute to the Fock potential. And these ones, they are sort of along for the ride. Uh, we get solutions at those k points, but they don't contribute to our Hamiltonian, uh, because they would they would contaminate our 
are, are nice Hamiltonian because of the fact that they're along, yeah, along some line, right, and not uh, on a nice uh, grid. So if you then afterwards uh, would plot your band structure, right, you would only look at contributions from these k points. You would have to throw away the rest, right? Yeah. Question. Yeah. Uh, in this case, can you still use reduce the q point? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because only those ones contribute to the potential. So, so they're the same as in any other calculation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in this case, is there really a need to do the first step hypothesis functional calculation, or I can just uh, directly use the, the generate? You know, I just uh, stop in the middle and just uh, directly use IBC case. Yes, that you could do as well. Right. I don't have to perform the Right. There's one thing that you can't do, uh, and that is, uh, that is uh, one thing to remember. What you cannot do, you cannot do, um, uh, oh, that is, that is wrong on this slide. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so what you actually cannot do, you can't do a start with, a, sta with a, a hybrid functional calculation here. So you cannot do a regular hybrid functional calculation and then restart and add these other k points. Why is that? That is because if you restart from a previous hybrid functional calculation, the wave functions that contribute to your total energy are the correct ones. So the code reads in those wave functions and will immediately stop. It will look at the energy, it will see there's no gradient on the wave function anymore because you're in the ground state and it will not optimize <coughs> the states at these points that are along for the right because there's no right. <coughs> so, uh, because these guys here, uh, the solutions at these k points that do not contribute to the total energy, they're not captured by, um, by the convergence criterion. So they can be of any quality. They can be phone numbers, and it wouldn't show up in the total energy. So from one step to the other, it won't, there won't be any change in the total energy if, if these are crap, and, uh, and they won't get optimized. Right? So you could do what you, what you say, you could do this from the start in one go, yeah, because then all states get optimized uh, along, the, along the whole, uh, whole line. Um, that is in, in a way expensive, right? Because if you would start from pre-converged PBE function, uh, functions, wave functions, you are already quite a way along, along uh, right? So, so, but you couldn't start from, uh, as it is written here, uh, I'm very sorry, you can't start from a, from a hybrid functional calculation, from a regular hybrid functional calculation, right? Yeah, we should at some point change this because, of course, you could recast your uh, convergence criterion such that you look at uh, the sum of the eigen energies uh, and, and include, <coughs> include all of them um, and simply say, okay, if that doesn't change anymore, I'm converged. So, but the way it is now, you have to... Um, you have to sort of rely on the fact that they get um, get optimized along with the rest. Yeah. So when we do like a k point parallel execution, mm -hmm. so those added k points will be counted as. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have to uh, you have to adjust this particular number uh, to reflect the total number of k points. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They get distributed like the rest. Yeah, it's two times there. Two times, it's okay. Yes. You have a yes. One over yeah. There. Yeah. Because this this one, well, you could put here zero. You could put it here one hundred times, but it doesn't contribute to anything, right? You would be redoing part of the work. That is true. But it, it takes the weight from the first time you did it. Is that yeah. Okay. So for this block of uh, th this block that represents the your irreducible wedge, uh, that you that you copy. Okay, you simply copy it from, you copy this file, this IVZ, this is this uh, irreducible part of the Brio and so on. You copy it to k-points, to your k-points file, rename it, and then add the points that you're interested in and adjust the number of points accordingly. So. How, how is that handling the symmetry? Because part of it is, the part that's actually weighted is symmetric, and then the part that's unweighted is not symmetric, right? So how is it? Yeah, well, it would, it would um, so symmetry, 
comes in at the point where, for instance, the density, uh, density is computed, right? Um, so uh, there these guys are ignored because of the fact that their weight is zero. So you could do all kinds of symmetry operations on them, but it doesn't end up in a result because they're weighted with zero weight. So, so the fact that this does not reflect the symmetry in any way doesn't show up. Yep. A few questions have come up online yes. over, yes. over the last few slides. Yep. Um, Let me quickly. So uh, one is hybrid band structures can also be plotted using the VAST2 one year 90 library and one year 91.2. Yep. However, the VAST2 one year 90 library only supports uh, 1.2 and not 2.0, so it can't be used for systems with SOC. Uh, is there any plan for it to support 2.0? There is a plan to support 3.0. 3.0. Yeah, I, 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 I met uh, Aris Mostofi at, <coughs> at some point uh, um, in the past, uh, a few months ago, and he said, yeah, he knew that, that we had trouble uh, uh, supporting 2.0. Um, and he said, well, hold off on, on, on trying that now. I said, yeah, I should really do this. And he said, uh, hold off, because we're going to release 3.0. Right. And there is, again, a slight, slight change in the API. So, so I will, I will uh, support 3.0, and, uh, and we'll skip 2.0. Yes. Yeah. Actually, that, that is the next slide. Uh, <laughs> yes. So you can use this. Uh, or was there another no, question? Oh, so there's actually, there's a few more. <coughs> okay. There's yeah. One more question. Okay. Probably related to what we yeah. were talking about. Um, is the tendency to make D bands wider universal for hybrid functionals, and is there a reason for that? Uh, and this is relating to the uh, CO module. Yes, the tendency is universal. Yes. Yes. And, and there's definitely uh, reasons for that, but <laughs> I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't explain them uh, quickly now. Uh, but yes, it's a universal tendency. Yes. Yeah. Um, so one, uh, actually uh, another best specific, can we use the NK red keyword during band structure calculation? Yes. Exclusion principle a correlation effect, and is it automatically taken into account by Hartree-Bond? Actually, um, Pauli excludes. Uh, well, huh. uh, no, it's not a correlation effect. Uh, depending on how you would define correlation, but so if you um, so the, the one the, the definition of correlation I like is that it's everything that's not in Hartree-Fock. Right. <laughs> right. So, uh, so the Pauli exclusion <laughs> principle is in Hartree Fock, so it's not a correlation effect. Yes. And there's probably people that will disagree with this definition, but I think it's a very nice definition, it's a very clean definition of correlation. And as I understood, as I understand, the, let's say, the, the, his the history of the field, uh, it, it makes some sense to define it like this, because of the fact when Hartree Fock was. Uh, conceived of, uh, uh, yeah, everything else is correlation. So what is still missing is correlation. Yep. Uh, and so we have uh, one other question going back to, well, a couple more questions going back <coughs> to the uh, computational aspects mm -hmm. um, and performance. Uh, what opportunities have been realized by using GPU processing for the Fourier transform steps? And does it result in a good speed up? Um, so yes, what so what so the, the part so the computation of the of the action of the Fock potential on the orbitals has in its entire has almost entirely been ported to GPU, um, and people do actually report nice speed ups. Um, I, I I'm not really willing to put my hand in into the fire and quote uh, numbers, but you. Do get I think you do uh, get nice speed ups uh, 
with, uh, with uh, the current implementation for this part because it's, so co it's quite compute heavy, right? You have really lots and lots of FFTs and they get sent to these, uh, to these uh, CUDA streams on the, on the GPU and I think that works quite well. Um, it always, I guess it always depends on the size of your system. I have not been able to find one small system where GPU gives you a real speed up. So there's a matter of overhead in, involved always, uh, but for large systems you, you should really get decent speed ups for these compute heavy, uh, uh, heavy uh, parts of the code. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and if not, then, then, then they should, people should complain to us. Because then we know that we have to work on it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Is it crazy to attempt an MP2 calculation instead of simple HF for the exchange energy while not degrading the correlation description? Um, so to do an MP2 calculation instead of HF? Yeah, for the exchange energy. Well, actually, I, I, I would, you would have to do both, I would say. I mean, you would do MP2 on top of Hartree Fock. I <coughs> don't know how you would use MP2 to compute the exchange energy. And, but, okay, so <coughs> it might, might be that I, that I misunderstand the question, but you would add, you would add MP2 on top of Hartree Fock. Uh, to, to, uh, because it gives you part of the correlation energy. Yeah. Okay, good. So let's let's uh, let's continue with uh, a bit about this. So how long? I, one and a half hours, right? So. How Okay, good. I'm losing track again as well. So, um, yes. Yeah, so another option to do band structure is through um, through the interface to uh, VASP to one year ninety, and to construct maximally localized one year functions out of your Bloch orbitals, and then use the functionality of uh, of one year ninety uh, to plot band structure. So you can uh, you construct localized functions out of your Bloch orbitals, and then use <coughs> them to construct block functions at arbitrary k points. That's the essential idea. I won't go into that uh, step by step here. There's an example in, in the hands-on session where you can try your hand at doing this. Um, just to say that this, essentially what this amounts to is a Fourier interpolation between the data points that you have, right? So the underlying data that you offer is still uh, the, the eigenvalues at at the k points of your regular grid, and then this is a clever way of Fourier interpolating between the data points that you have. Uh, because normally, if you if you would do band structure, I mean interpolation is easy. Uh, if you know which points to connect, you can always throw a function through it. The, the trouble is always that from one k point to the other, you don't know how which bands to connect to which. Right? You don't know how did how did order of, of bands with similar character might change from one k point to the other. So how, how to connect them. Same thing actually if you do a band structure with, with one of the other methods that I described, right? So I can take a bunch of k points. At some point uh, there might be a few uh, close together and you don't know whether you should uh, let them cross or whether you would have an avoided crossing from one, from one k point to the other. This gives you a way, this, this is sort of a way of Fourier uh, interpolation connected with state following. So you would know to which point connects to which and then you Fourier interpolate, interpolate between the points that you have. And that's the essence of this, uh, of this particular way of doing band structure. And there's an example that, uh, that you can, uh, can look at. Right, so... Um, We've been saying, okay, we solve these, uh, these Rothaan equations. And uh, yesterday, um, I made the point that, uh, that we don't do, uh, that, that there was two ways of, uh, of, of solving for, for uh, our Kohn-Sham equations. I made the point that we could do this 
uh, by computing the gradient and directly optimize the wave functions uh, in a direction that minimizes the total energy, or that we can, could use this self-consistency cycle and that actually it was preferable to use the self-consistency cycle. Um, that is unfortunately now no longer uh, strictly true. Uh, and we have here for these hybrid functionals, we return to, uh, to the use of direct optimization. And that is because um, what we had in the self-consistency cycle, we rely on iterative diagonalization. Well, that we could use here without any trouble, but also on density mixing. And now we have a functional that doesn't only depend on the, on the density. And these, these mixing methods, they, it's still strongly dominated by the density. So mixing might work for hybrid functionals as well, but it's not guaranteed to work. Uh, because the mixer doesn't have all the information. Uh, normally, the density carries all the information about your system. But here, the orbitals play a role as well, because we have this Fock potential uh, that doesn't depend on the density per se, but on the orbitals. So density mixing will work in many cases. Uh, so uh, so the, the usual algorithms that you would use, like Davidson or RMM, will work uh, in many cases for, um, for hybrid functions as well, <coughs> especially the Davidson. Um, but it's not guaranteed to work. Uh, and actually, it turns out that there's a way to do this in, in direct optimization that, at least for hybrid functionals, is even faster than, uh, than doing the Davidson optimization. Right. So the problem we said, why, and, and, and that was why we went to this uh, self-consistency cycle in combination with density mixing, is that we, had, uh, yeah, that we were in danger of, uh, of charge sloshing in, uh, in our direct optimization. And the thing is, uh, we work around that in a, in a different way uh, here. Um, uh, so we don't rely on density mixing per se, but we follow the gradient, um, and the gradient, like, like I, I said yesterday, has a part that it points out, uh, so out of our current subspace, and a part that represents rotations between the current orbitals. And it was this part, uh, this subspace rotational part, uh, that was uh, prone to charge sloshing. And uh, so what we do now is, uh, so that we need for, for this part of the gradient, we need to uh, find a search direction, um, a unitary transformation between the orbitals, between our current orbitals, between the orbitals of our current subspace. Um, and this search direction is given in, uh, through perturbation theory. You can write it like this, right? And this is exactly the time, uh, the, the term that is prone to, uh, to charge sloshing. And now we will use a, a We'll use a, a density mixing scheme to only uh, determine this part. So we'll, use, we'll rely again on density mixing to uh, determine an optimal subspace rotation. And this part of the gradient we'll simply directly use. So how is that done? That is done by, um, by, uh, by a an, an, an additional uh, cycle. So we have a Hamilton matrix at, at some point, right? So we have a bunch of orbitals that give us uh, an Hamiltonian with a kinetic energy and a local potential and, and a Fock potential, right? Depending not on the density but on the orbitals. And we'll determine a subspace rotation matrix that diagonalizes this Hamiltonian. Recompute occupancies and things like this. Transform the orbitals partial occupancies rely on, uh, on, on density, so that gives us a density, rely on density mixing and iterate until we find, um, uh, un until we, um, find a stable point, right? But we'll keep this term, we'll keep fixed. So we do density mixing only with respect to this part of the Hamiltonian, right? And it's the electrostatic part that is prone to charge sloshing. So we don't, we don't re-evaluate the Fock potential all the time. That would be very uh, expensive. We'll use density mixing to find, to only search for an optimal uh, subspace rotation that gives us a stable density. And we'll use that one in, in the expression for our gradient, uh, for our gradient in the direct optimization. So um, yes. 
So we sort of combined uh, the best of both worlds. Uh, um, we'll, use, we'll use the gradient so that in each step there's only one evaluation of the Fock potential. This is a, this is a nice advantage with respect to uh, Krilov space methods, so to these methods like Davidson where we have to apply within one uh, iterative refinement of the wave function, we have to apply the Hamiltonian very often to the orbitals that we have. And applying the Hamiltonian to the orbitals means computing the action of the Fock potential on the orbitals, which is very expensive. Right? In these direct optimization methods, you compute a gradient, which means computing the action of the Fock potential on the orbitals only once, and then follow the gradient. So it's, it's cheaper in that sense. Uh, but we do uh, add this, this additional uh, loop inside where we search, uh, where we use density mixing to search for an, for an optimal subspace rotational matrix. <coughs> and use density mixing to get around to charge sloshing. So that's the full uh, mixed scheme. Uh, construct a Hamiltonian from the current orbitals. We have an inner loop that, uh, that keeps the Fock potential uh, fixed. Um, and where we only search for an optimal subspace rotation using density mixing and then we minimize along the search direction defined by, well, this is the part of the gradient outside of our subspace and this optimal rotational matrix inside our subspace. And we'll do, uh, uh, well, we'll repeat this and this inner loop huh, and, and the loop around it until we reach convergence, right? So that is shown here. Uh, it's a very similar picture that we saw before, right? So we have here, uh, these were these elongated, uh, elongated uh, uh, FCC iron cells uh, where we had uh, big trouble uh, converging uh, the electronic uh, system uh, using direct optimization. And actually, this is now the mixed scheme. So this is direct optimization. Uh, um, but it uses this, this, this second loop, this second uh, uh, trick to, uh, to get around charge sloshing um, uh, in the subspace rotational part that depends on, um, on density mixing. And we see that that, that re really converges uh, quite nicely. So these are the, the tags and links associated with this. I hope that that uh, I, finally, I finally got PowerPoint uh, to produce PDF that, that, uh, st <laughs> that still keeps the active links. So there should be links to our, to our wiki. Um, documents are online. And I think that uh, with this, probably we could take a, a bit of a break. It should be good. Well, 15 minutes. OK, cool. So if there's any questions, do you have still online Questions or questions from the yeah yes. You mentioned uh, the limitation of deeply lived being its uh, being that it, it doesn't uh, represent the solid state physics correctly because of the different behavior of the LYB coefficient function. Then can you explain why it is so popular in the computational chemistry community? Because they don't suffer so much from this because they, they're um, um, in solid state, where you have these extended states, uh, your system is so much more like a, a homogeneous electron gas, which is one of the reasons why LDA, is, uh, which is a very coarse approximation in a sense, uh, works quite well in many cases. Um, so if you, go, if, you, if you would do B3 lip for a, for a simple metal, uh, where you have a density that is very homogeneous, um, yeah, the fact that, that your correlation functional doesn't adhere to this to the to the homogeneous electron gas limit, um, and this LYP uh, correlation doesn't adhere to this particular limit, uh, hurts you a lot. Uh, if you go to the molecular world where this came from, um, their systems are not so so homogeneous electron gas like, so they don't see this. I guess what I want to know is given that PV zero. Because it works well for their systems. Better than I guess so, yes. Yes. I mean, you shouldn't forget, I mean, uh, something like B3LIP has been, has, so there's, there's a mixture of a, of, a, of a bunch of functional components. 
that has been optimized against uh, a test set, against properties of, of a whole bunch of molecules. So, so at least for an, anything that is very much like this test set, it, it, well, it, it's, I could envision it to be superior. Yep. From online. So, are these tags sufficient to avoid charge sloshing, or do we also need L subrot? Uh, you have to set L subrot, yes. Sorry, yeah, because that switches on this, uh, this second loop. Ah, oh, yeah, this is not on this slide. Okay, yes. Yes. It's a very important tag because that is exactly the one that switches it, uh, switches it on. Um, it's probably not on this slide because it used to be the default, so you could only switch it off. But these days you have to switch it on. Yes, because there's many systems, there's still many systems, especially if you have a decent sized gap, uh, where charge sloshing is not such a problem. Or if you, have, uh, if you don't have a, a cell that is very long in a, in a particular direction, you wouldn't run into this problem uh, ever so, so often. Um, yes. So the default used to be that it was switched on, but now it's switched off per default, and you can switch it on with this LSAP hot tag. Yeah. So you mentioned that hydrofunctionals open up the band gap. Are there any systematic trends in the band shapes, like the effective masses that you know of for hydrofunctionals? Um, um, ha. Huh. So I, I know, well, so one of the remarks here is D, D band widths, for instance, they are too wide, so too dispersive. So that would uh, immediately show up in your effective masses, right? So for S and P, do you think there'll be similar um, shapes? No, I think for S and P, this problem is 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 much uh, smaller. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So it's these states that that the hybrid fun functional tends to localize very strongly, like like these states, uh, much more strongly than uh, than DFT does, uh, where DFT mostly underestimates localization. Uh, that are that are strongly affected by the fact that you use a hybrid function. Yeah. Yes. So another one online. In HSE calculations, how does the computational time scale for the number of k points, the number of electrons, and the number of atoms? Right. So in k points, it scales uh, quadratically uh, with respect to the number of k points that you use. Um, so for the number of atoms, we saw that the underlying scaling was uh, cubic, right? So if you, if you end up in the limit of large systems, um, then you, end, you see the fundamental scaling, which is cubic. That's the number of states times the number of states times uh, n log n for the FFTs uh, with, with some horrible prefactor. Um, <laughs> And this n log n is something like n, so it's it's a bit beyond it's a bit more than than cubic, yeah. Yes. And the number of electrons is same. Is same. Yes, the system size. System size is essentially n like number of electrons number. with some yes number of atoms or yes. Yeah. Um, uh, you skipped over a slide on transition metal oxide. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I did this one. I, I always I always ask myself why I have this slide. So I'll <laughs> immediately go here. Um, yes. So these these transition metal uh, monoxides. They're quite interesting uh, systems in this respect, uh, because. So what have people been using? So DFT is, is, is unsatisfactory for, for these systems. So you have uh, magnetic moments that are, that are too small and uh, lattice constants that are too small. And, and people have been using um, uh, DFT plus U on, on these systems. So Hubbard U, uh, on-site uh, on Hubbard U. Um, and, uh, and actually, so what, what do you do? So on, with DFT plus U, you, uh, you on site, well, within the PRW sphere, for instance, you do uh, something that is uh, Hartree Fock like. Yeah, so, so you would expect that with hybrid functionals, you would get an effect that's very similar without, without having to choose a U or a fit, fit some parameter to experimental, uh, 
to experimental, uh, experimentally known uh, properties of your system. Um, and, that is, uh, and that is in fact the case, and that is what, what is shown here. Uh, so in LDA we have, for instance, for manganese oxide we have a, 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 a lattice constant that is much too small, we have a magnetic moment that is much too small, and we have hardly any band gap, uh, it should be quite a, it has quite a sizable gap in experiment, and, um, and it uh, doesn't have this in, um, in LDA or in any other DFT functional, right? So I might change this a bit, but not by much. And if you look at, at what you get, uh, so you could repair this with, with uh, on-site Hubbard U interaction. And if you go to hybrid functional theory, you, sa you see that you get there quite some way, right? So it's not, it's not perfect. Um, for instance, the uh, gap size is, uh, is still, uh, is still uh, qu quite a bit off for cobalt oxides, even overestimated. Um, but, uh, but it repairs uh, a, a whole bunch of the deficiencies uh, of, uh, of the density functional theory. So, and that all boils down to the fact that, that these systems, so what, what, you, what you see here are, are aspects that, are, that go, go back to the D electrons, the 3D electrons uh, of the transition metals, and they're much too delocalized in, in density functional theory. And in hybrid functional theory, they get more localized on site and more atomic-like. Uh, as they actually should be. Yep. Okay. So we have one more question that's come up. Okay. Um, if the K-point convergence with HSE is too slow, does it make sense to make the screening artificially shorter so that a larger NK red could be, in, uh, could be used? As a um, example, with a smaller number of <coughs> Right, so, um, well, possibly, <laughs> but, but, there's, but then of course that would, that uh, changing this, this, uh, changing this, this screening length um, doesn't only affect, uh, affect uh, the cost of the functional, it will also yield other results. Right, so you, you will not get the same results at, at a reduced cost. You will get other results at a possibly reduced cost. So it might be that you get a, you get quicker to a wrong answer then. Um, so I'm, it's impossible to say. So this this screening length actually it, it's well it's 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 a variable. You could set it, but it has for HSE it has a particular value, right? This value has been fitted to a whole bunch of test systems. So, uh, so they did band gaps uh, for a whole bunch of test systems and then, uh, and then fitted um, uh, band gaps or lattice constants, I can't remember. Anyway, it has been fitted to, to experimental data and, uh, and so it's part of the definition. So you, of course you can, can take another value for it, but you won't be using HSE anymore then. Um, yes, I, w I would. I would expect it to to act much like it does now. Uh, so, for instance, here, uh, if if this is one of the, the problems that you have, if if one of the problems that you have is that your states are not localized enough, you're still adding parts of of uh, of, of Fock exchange. So, so your functional will tend to be more. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll tend to localize electrons more strongly, <coughs> but but I I think it's um, yeah it's there's no guarantee that 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 it will that it will give you a good result. You would have to you have to look at experiment then again, right? Which is which all all semi-empirical things would would uh, would sort of. Uh, in the same need you have with all semi-empirical methods. So you can do DFT plus U, and, and then there's always the question, so what on-site uh, uh, energy should I use? What on-site U should I use? And uh, yeah, you play with this, and you look at, uh, do I reproduce my magnetic moments? Do I get a better band gap? Things like this. And then this justifies, uh, the end justifies the means in that sense. But you couldn't then simply take it to another situation and say, okay, now this is a nice functional, now do, do another material. You would have to start there all over again, right? Yeah. 
Yes? There was one part that I didn't understand, which was, um, so you said that the <coughs> hybrid functional helps localize the few orbitals. So my, my understanding is that localization usually reduces the bandwidth rather than spreads out the bandwidth. So why does it also spread out the deep bandwidth, even though it's localizing the, the, the wave functions? Right. So in this, so for this transition metal monoxides, it, uh, it localizes them uh, more strongly. Um, yes, that's a good question. Um, huh. uh, you got me there. Okay. But it does tend to localize them, and it does increase the bandwidth of these <laughs> three electronic <laughs> systems. But uh, yes, no, you, you've got me there. I don't have a quick answer for you. Okay, because it's right. true, right? Yes, yeah. You would say, OK, if I, if I reduce them, I would reduce hybridization <coughs> and, and in that way uh, reduce dispersion. But that is not the case here. OK, I'll think yeah. about it. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so you say uh, the LDF plus U, U part is coming as like a hard default lag, but it's not quite hard default, right? But in the one sense, U is supposed to take care of the correlation, but hard default, anything beyond hard default should be correlation. So I'm saying regarding right. uh, another point, I'm saying like when you add the U, you're capturing the correlation for on the hard default. Maybe you can, can, can you safely say we are getting the right physics for the wrong reason because hard default is localizing we are getting the bandwidth opening, but actually it's not for the correlation, but for manganese oxide, you know, the gap opens up for the correlation. So that should be rather be taking with the yes. usual kind of term, not with the, the hybrid functional kind of reason. Yes. So uh, if the bandwidth goes up, basically you're not capturing the correlation, but it's just because of the exact exchange contribution that's taking into account. So, um, what would you say if we qualitatively compare LDF plus U and HSC? Like, uh, what's the In my experience, they're very similar. I mean, that, that is, uh, so what, what you see here, for instance, in this table, which, which these are like these, these typical systems where you would use LDA plus U, right? Sure. So um, I think with LDA plus U, you get, I, I, it's an oversight that it's not on this on this particular table, but this I think this is the kind of agreement that you can reach for all these aspects. So I'm sure that you could that you could get a better band gap with with another U. But with the U, we do see band, uh, bandwidth narrowing down, right? I mean the right. upper right. for those uh, right. narrower. Yes. We don't see for the hybrid functional. Now for the hybrid functional here, you would uh, you would also see a band with narrowing, but you don't see it for these D metals. Yeah, the magnetic oxide, right? or, or the D, D No, no, for these, for these, for these D-metallic surfaces, oh, that, that is what he yeah. meant. For these ones, you see, you see uh, narrowing. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. So we have a couple more questions online, but we're also fast approaching break. Okay. <laughs> so maybe, <laughs> that sounds like it's the break a lot. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll uh, continue with some questions either at the end of the break or Afterwards. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, uh, half hour break. You said that there were some questions still connected to the to the previous talk uh, from yeah, so offline questions. Yeah. Questions yeah, I think. Should yeah. We begin with, uh, I think that's a good idea, and, and if there are other questions from the audience here as well, because uh, <coughs> the, the next talk, I don't think it takes one and a half hours, so, so we have some time. One hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> 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 okay. okay. So, uh, so one question we had uh, a little earlier in the session was, why does DFT tend to delocalize? Is it due to the self-interaction in the heart tree? To the self interaction in the heart tree energy. Uh -huh. hmm. Maybe. Hmm. <laughs> well, there's, there's, yes, DFT is not free of self interaction. Uh, whether, whether that's the reason it, it, it yields de two delocalized functions, I. <coughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to put it on that person. I'm. I'm. I'm not a. I'm. In that respect, I'm not a. Not a DFT expert. So, so 
Uh, is, I, it, is it not because it's based on the homogeneous vector gas, which is a thing of the Yes, some functions are based purely on the homogeneous electron gas, but but not all, right? So so there's many functionals that that are that are uh, based on on uh, yeah all kinds of limits that are known for for a correlation and. Uh, um, okay, so about uh, knobs to tweak, I guess. If the uh, convergence of magnetic moment and self-consistent steps uh, it isn't good, uh, particularly for large systems, can you suggest what parameters? If the convergence for, adjust. sorry, again. So if the convergence of um, magnetic moment <coughs> and the self-consistent steps in HSE calculations is poor, um, and this is particularly in relation to large systems, what parameters would you suggest adjusting? OK, so there's, so especially for magnetic calculations, the, um, there's a few things that are very important. Um, one thing is that you would have to always initialize your, your magnetic subsystem, right? So I don't know, you shouldn't rely on, on any default. I think that per default, uh, the code will simply put one mu bore on each atom uh, in, in a sort of a ferromagnetic way, so which not necessarily has anything to do with the magnetic structure of your system. Um, so initializing it in, in, a, in, a, in a good way, so that if you have some knowledge of what, what the magnetic uh, order should be, um, that is very important. So, and that would drastically uh, affect convergence. Um, on the other hand, there's, it, it is also um, a problem that, uh, especially if you, if you use density mixing, I don't, I, so I don't know what kind of electronic optimizer they are using, but as soon as you, uh, as soon as you use something that, that relies essentially on density mixing, um, the magnetic degrees of freedom um, are, are often overlooked by the mixer. So what does this mean? So the mixer learns something about the response of your system. That starts with this model function and that it improves with every step that it makes. Mixing, uh, it learns something about the dielectric properties of your system. It will do such a thing for, uh, for the magnetic degrees of freedom as well. So the magnetization density is also pushed through the mixer and, and uh, gets looked at. But the dominant, uh, the dominant properties that are learned are electrostatic properties. Uh, so it learns more strongly, let's say, about the electrostatics of your system and how to mix the total charge density than how to work with the magnetization density. Um, so at some point, I think it's in, in one part of the manual, it is, uh, it's, it's advisable to, to go away from the Broiden mixer completely and then use straight linear mixing uh, because then the magnetic subsystem uh, gets pulled uh, yeah, it gets pulled on the same level uh, as, the, as, the, as the total charge. And, uh, and it might be that then convergence is more rapid. So as of a certain point, uh, when your charge density is more or less uh, stable, uh, then, then, then the magnetic degrees of freedom uh, get optimized. They're, they're often much weaker. And uh, yes, so that could help. But it would depend on what kind of optimizer one is using, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so another question we have is, uh, some people vary the fraction of the exact exchange on a case-by-case -case basis, trying to optimize performance for a particular material, e.g. with respect to the band gap. Uh, would you say this is a reasonable model to use? Um, uh, yes, it is. Um, it's not something that I that I strongly advise uh, that one does, um, because of course you you sort of enter uh, yeah, you enter into the semi-empirical domain again. So it's not it's not the nicest thing to do, but but there's some justification for doing it as well, and and we'll see this later on that there is a connection between the fraction of of 
um, of exchange that we use. So this one quarter, for instance. Why is this one quarter good for a whole group of, of, uh, of materials? And that is because, uh, because of the screening properties of these uh, materials. And we'll see this in connection with, with GW, that this one quarter is sort of in the range where, where, uh, where important contributions in GW, and GW is essentially a screened exchange interaction, uh, uh, where, where in, in that area GW is, is sort of behaving like this one, one quarter. So the dielectric properties in this one quarter of exchange, they, they so provide a, a reasonable match. Uh, if you then go to larger bands, so this is the case for, for small to medium sized gap systems. If you then go to larger gap systems, uh, screening properties there are different. And based on, on those screening properties, you could justify using a larger portion of, uh, of Fock exchange. So especially if, if you go to, uh, to that part where, uh, where, where there's still really substantial deviation, so moving up to, to systems with, uh, with larger band gaps, uh, the uh, hybrid functionals that include one quarter of, of Fock exchange uh, perform less well than, than down here. Um, and that, that you could, in fact, repair by using um, a larger portion of Fock exchange, and that would be justifiable by looking at the, at the screening properties of the system. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so it's it's hard now to quickly describe what DFT plus U is. I mean, I don't have any slides here to, to support that. So I would suggest that uh, it's not not so hard to find out. Uh, but what is the cost of it? The cost is essentially the same as doing DFT calculations. So that is, of course, a very attractive. Uh, if this is if this is a, an approximation that works well for your class of systems. And, and for that, I, I would say you would have to look in the literature. So is the physics that are, that are going on in your system anything that are sort of captured by, by something like DFT plus, by a DFT plus U approximation? Um, and do you get resu good results with DFT, DFT plus U? Then, then I, I could imagine using that instead of a hybrid functional, because it's so much more exp uh, expensive to use a hybrid functional. Um, they are commonly fitted uh, to uh, fit to to experimentally known aspects of your system, so band gap, magnetic moments, things like this. Um, there are ways to uh, to compute a U, a U from constrained DFT. Um, so that would remove the the fact that that you are so then you would no longer be using a semi-empirical uh, method. Huh? It would put it on an ab initio basis, or at least on a DFT basis. Um, but sometimes those U's are not the U's that yield the best agreement with experiment, and people decide not to use <coughs> them then. Yeah. And prefer to stay with the, with the semi-empirical nature of <coughs> And, uh, well, there are examples that LDA plus U erroneously opens a band gap for some metals. Do you see this sure. hybrids? Uh, I would say that, w I mean, in LDA plus U, it, it would strongly depend on the U, right? I mean, you could probably open up, more or less open up a band gap in any system if you, if you uh, because this what, this, what does this U sort of do? It sort of sucks in electrons on, on the side, right? So it's, and uh, uh, so it contracts those states and sucks them into the spheres, uh, very hand-wavingly speaking. So you could sort of, in this way, open up a gap in, 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 in many systems uh, if you make this interaction strong enough, right? So, I mean, that, that is... Yeah, so you can you can sort of yeah you can sort of 
to do a lot of injustice to, to the physics of your system with, with these methods. And a hybrid functional doesn't give you this, this leeway, right? So it might, it might uh, maybe wrongly predict a system to be insulating where it should be a metal. Could be. Why not? But it's not simply, it's not something that you that you'd tune. Right? So, so yeah. Yes. Is there a new manual update plan that as a general yes. rule should users check the wiki for? I, I would, um, yes. The, the problem is that we are sort of in between. We are, we are filling the wiki. And uh, so there's stuff that's in the manual that's not in the wiki. And there's stuff in the wiki that's not yet in the manual. So I would advise people <coughs> to use the wiki where possible. But with the caveat that some stuff uh, is unfortunately uh, not yet incorporated. Right, so the wiki is definitely more up to date uh, with some respects, um, but not it's not it's not um, not everything that is in the manual has been carried over into the wiki. Yes, okay. it's very unfortunate, and it's 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 really stupid work to do this, but but unfortunately. Uh, we, we simply lacked the manpower to do this very quickly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, another user asks, uh, I tried to use VAST 5.3.5 to calculate the <coughs> final state core level binding energy with I core level equals 2 using HSE, but got an incorrect core level. <coughs> uh, okay. Is there any updates? Or version for HSE with high core level 2? Um, uh, no. There's <laughs> no, there's no, uh, no update. Um, but I would ask uh, this person to send us a bug report. Yeah. Be, yes. And one more, which I guess is a, a mixture of VASP and Cori specific. How can we speed up calculations in Cori? There are variables like n-core, n-par, n-sim, but I don't know what would be optimal. Right. We'll do this tomorrow. Right. Tomorrow's session. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, we'll yes. want to address this. OK. Online questions. Are there any more in the room before we continue with the original schedule? I think uh, stuff in the, we can do this during the hands-on or whatever, I think.